Who are the people around the president of the United States that give advice in this six minute window? How many of them, just to, maybe you could speak to the detail of that, but also to the spirit of the way they see the world. How many of them are warmongers? How many of them are kind of big picture, peace, humanity type of thinkers? Well, again, we're talking about that six minute window. So it's not exactly like you can, let me put a pot of coffee on and really tell me what you think. And we can strategize here, right? You have your sec def and your chairman, maybe the vice chairman. And Okay, we haven't even begun to talk about the fact that at the same time, these advisors also have an inc a parallel concern, and that's called continuity of government, mm -hmm. okay? So while they're trying to advise on the nuclear counterstrike in response to the incoming nuclear missile, they have to be thinking, how are we going to keep the government functioning when the missiles start hitting, mm -hmm. when the bombs start going off? And that is about getting yourself out of the Pentagon, let's say, getting yourself to a, one of these nuclear bunkers that I write about at length in the book. So how much can you ask of a human, right? Because it comes down to a human. The Secretary of Defense is a human. Um, and, and imagine that job while trying to advise the president. And then there's also a really interesting term, which I learned about, called jamming the president which is often understood in Washington that the military advisors would, we don't know if this is legit, we've never seen it put to the test, but jamming the president means the military advisors are gonna push for a really aggressive counterattack immediately. Mm -hmm. And again, you're the president who's not really been paying attention to this because he has many other things to deal with. Speed is not conducive to wisdom. Can you speak to the jamming the president? So your sense is the advisors would, by default, be pushing for aggressive counterattack. That is a term in sort of the national security, nuclear command and control, historical documentation, that many of the people that you might call the more dovish type people are, you know, worried about that the more hawkish people are going to the military advisors, yeah. right, are going to are going to be jamming the president to make these decisions about tar which targets, not if, right. but which what. Targets. The argument yeah. will be about which targets, yes. not about if. Yes, I I hope that even the warmongers would uh, at this moment, because what underlies the idea of you wanting to go to war? It's it's power. It's like wanting to destroy the enemy and be the, the the big kid on the block. But with nuclear war, it just feels like that falls apart. Do Do you think warmongers actually believe they can win a nuclear war? Well, you've raised a really important question that we look to the historical record for right. that answer, right? Because y astonishingly, all of this began like when when Russia first got the bomb in 1949. The powers that be, and I write about them in the book as in a setup to the first, you know, for the for the moment of launch, right? Like it's called how we got here, right? And you see, and I cite, you know, declassified documents from some of these early um, meetings where nuclear war plans were being laid out. And absolutely, back in the 1950s, the, the generals and the admirals that were running the nuclear command and control system believed that we could fight and win a nuclear war, despite hundreds of millions of people dying. This was the prevailing thought. And only over time did did the did the kind of concept come into play that no we can we can never have a nuclear war it's the famous gorbachev and reagan joint statement a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought but before that many people be believed that it could be won and they were preparing for that not to be political and not to be ageist but do uh, cognitive abilities and all that kind of stuff come into play here? So if so much is riding on the president, is there tests that are conducted? Is there regular training procedures on the president that you're aware of? Do you know? 
I don't think that has anything to do with ageism. I think it has to do with, I think it's an earnest question, a really powerful one. And if people were to ask that question of themselves or their sort of, you know, dinner party guests or their family around the dinner table guests, you might come to a real good conclusion about how bad our political system is and how bad our presidential candidates are. Because why on earth there would be two candidates, one of whom has cognitive problems and the other of whom has judgment problems. Um, these are the two biggest issues with a nuclear launch, judgment and cognition. And so where's the, you know, young-ish, um, thoughtful, forward-looking, wise, dedicated civil servant running for president? I know that sounds, you know, fantastical, but I wish it weren't. So that's one of the things that you really think about when voting for president is uh, this scenario that we've been describing, these six minutes. Imagine the man or woman sitting there for six minutes waiting for the pot of coffee. But I think about that issue with, with, any, with any war, right? I mean, prior to writing Nuclear War, a scenario, I previously wrote six books on military and intelligence programs designed to prevent nuclear war. And I believe the president as commander-in-chief should be of the highest character possible because the, the programs, the wars that's, that we have fought since World War II have all been, you know, how many octogenarian sources have I interviewed? I'm talking about Nobel laureates and weapons designer and spy pilots and engineers in general. They've all said to me with great pride, you know, we prevented World War III, nuclear World War III, right? And that, but that idea that the commander in chief and everyone in the, in, within the national security apparatus should be making really good decisions about, about war. It's the oldest cliche in the world that, you know, the, the wars are fought by the young kids. And that is, it's not a cliche, it's true. And so the character part about the president should be in play, whether we're thinking about nuclear war or any war, in my opinion. Well, uh, I agree with you, first of all, but it feels like when nuclear war, one person becomes like exponentially more important. With uh, regular war, the decision to go to war or not, uh, advisors start mattering more. There's judgment issues. You can start to make arguments for um, sort of more leeway in terms of what kind of people we elect. It seems like with nuclear war, there's no leeway. It's like one mm -hmm. person can uh, resist this, uh, uh, the jamming the president force, the the warmongers, the use, the, the, like uh, all the calculation involved in considering what are the errors, the mistakes, the missiles flying over Russia, the full dynamics of the geopolitics going on in the world. Consider all of humanity, the history of humanity, the future of humanity, all the your loved all all of it just loaded in to make a decision. Then it becomes much more important that your cognitive abilities are strong and your judgment abilities against against powerful, wise people, just as a human being, are strong. So, I think that's something to really, really consider when you vote for president. But to which degree is it really on the president versus to the people advising? Oh, no, it's on the president. The president has to make the call. And that six-minute window happens so fast. I mean, the president is going to be being moved for part of that time. The Secret Service is going to be, you know, up against up against Stratcom, Stratcom saying, we need launch, you know, we need the launch orders. And the Secret Service is going to be saying, we need to move the president. So it's not as much that he's delegating the issues. It's more like the issue is being postponed because there is only one issue for the president to say, these targets, you know, for him to choose from the Denny's like menu, okay, this is what we're going to go with. And then this astonishing thing happens. The president pulls, you know, takes out his wallet. He has a card in it that's colloquially called the biscuit. And that card with the codes matches up an item in the, the briefcase, in the in the football. 
that then is received by an officer underneath the bunk underneath the Pentagon in that bunker. It's a call and response, Lex. It's like, you know, Alpha Zeta, right? That's it. And that then back so that the individual in the bunker realizes they are getting the command from the president. And then that order is passed to Stratcom. And Stratcom, the commander of Stratcom, and I interviewed a former commander of Stratcom, commander of Stratcom then follows orders, which is he delivers the launch orders to the nuclear triad. And what's done is done. What would you do if you were the commander of Stratcom in that situation? What would you do? Because I, I like my gut reaction right now, if you just throw me in there, I would refuse orders. Okay, so good question. I asked that exact question to one of my very helpful sources on the book, Dr. Glenn McDuff, who is at Los Alamos and who for a while was the classified, they have a, a museum that's classified within the lab. And he was the historian in charge of it, right? So he's a nuclear weapons engineer. He worked on Star Wars during the Reagan era. And, and he does a lot having to do with the history of Los Alamos. And the, by the way, the Oppenheimer movie really, because I've reported on nuclear weapons for, you know, 12 years now. And Oppenheimer movie had a very, to me, positive impact on Los Alamos's transparency with people like me. They had a real willingness to share information. I think before, perhaps they were on their heels feeling they needed to be on the defensive. But now they're much more forthcoming. They were super helpful. I can tell you the origin story of the football, which they declassified for the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, I asked this question to Dr. Glenn McDuff, right? Like, in a different manner, I said, is there a chance that the STRATCOM commander would defy orders? And he said, Annie, you have a better chance winning Powerball. Why do you think? What's his intuition behind that? You don't wind up as STRATCOM commander unless you are someone who follows orders. You follow orders. You don't think there's a deep humanity there? that Because his, his intuition is about everything we know so far, but... It, this situation has never happened in the history of Earth. Well, this is true. And all right, so you're raising a really tricky, interesting conundrum here. Because during COVID, when President Trump and the leader of North Korea were kind of locked in various relationships with one another, good, bad, threatening, non-threatening, friendly, just bananas, you might say, like not presidential behavior. If you were someone watching C-SPAN, like I do, nerding out on what STRATCOM was actually saying about all this, you noticed that STRATCOM commanders were speaking out publicly to Congress more so than ever I had ever seen before. And this issue came up, would you defy presidential orders? So the caveat I would say to McDuff's answer of, easier to win, win the Powerball, right, um, is that if the commander of STRATCOM interpreted the president's behavior to be unreliable, to be non-presidential, then dot, dot, dot. But now you're into some really radical territory. Well, I mean, fundamentally, it feels like just looking at all the presidents of the United States in my lifetime, it feels like none of them are qualified for this six minutes. So like I could see, uh, you know, I, I could I could see as being the commander of his track on being like this guy, like <laughs> basically respecting no president. I, I know you're supposed to the commander in chief, but in this situation, saying like, I mean, everybody, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, if I was a commander of Stratcom, I'd be like, this, what does this guy know about any of this? Um, it, 
I would defy orders. I mean, in this situation, when the 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 the, the future of human civilization hangs in the balance, I mean, it, to be the person that says yes, launch. It's no matter what, I just can't see a human being on Earth being able to do that in the United States of America. That's a hell of a decision. Like this is it. That's is it. it. Well, but now you've raised a great, important, you know, presentation essentially, because what you're saying is people be aware, right? Be aware of like why you're voting or why certain individuals are being escalated to even being able to run for president. What does that mean? Why are people in America not more involved as citizens? Do we have a responsibility for that? Because you've opened up the door for people to understand, okay, the ultimate thing is the, is the nuclear launch decision. So if a person can't be trusted with that, you know, everything spiral, everything unravels from there. Also, I want to look up who's the commander of Stratcom now. <laughs> um, speaking of which, you've interviewed a lot of experts for this book. Is there... Uh, some commonalities about the way you've talked about this a little bit, but in, in the way they see this whole situation, what, what like scares them the most about uh, this whole system and uh, the whole possibility of nuclear war. I first learned about nuclear weapons from a guy called Al O'Donnell, who appears in my earlier books because I interviewed him for over a period of four and a half years because he was an engineer who actually wired nuclear bombs in the 1950s. He was a member of the Manhattan Project in 1946, worked on Operation Crossroads, the first explosions of nuclear bombs after the war ended, after World War II ended, and went on to arm, wire, and fire 186 out of the 200-some-odd atmospheric nuclear tests that the United States did before this was banned. And so I learned from him the power of these weapons, right? And I learned from him this very almost nationalistic idea about how important it was to have nuclear weapons. And while I learned a lot about his human side, I also saw, saw the side of him that was very Cold War warrior, right? And then, so he was kind of the first, and then, I don't know, there have been a hundred people that have been directly involved in nuclear weapons along the way. Billy Waugh, who was my subject of my main, my main sort of central figure in a book I wrote about the CIA's paramilitary called Surprise, Kill, Vanish. And Waugh halo-jumped um, a tactical nuclear weapon into the Nevada test site with a small team almost unknown to anyone, right? Only recently declassified. And so his position was like, tactical nuclear weapons may end up being used. So I'm trying to speak here to the scope of different people I have interviewed over, over the years, right? And what has happened is as as we're as I've gotten closer to the present day, you know, in arrears, there seems to be a growing movement from some of these cold warriors off the position of nuclear weapons make us great and strong toward something must be done to reduce this threat. How much do you know uh, in the same way that you know about the United States? How much do you know about the Russian side? Maybe the Chinese side? Uh, India and Pakistan, that all, all, all of this, like what, how their thinking differs, perhaps. Yes. Well, for that, you you want to go to the experts, right? So, in for Russia, for example, um, there's a guy called Pavel Podvig, who is probably the West's top expert on Russian nuclear forces. He works in parallel with the UN. He also studied in Moscow. And he interviewed, so my information comes from him, right? Like you do all the footwork to know what questions to ask, and then you take the very specific questions to him. And I learned from him about how the Russian command and control goes down. And it's very similar to ours because America and Russia have been at sort of nuclear dueling with one another mm -hmm. um, 
for 75 years now. And so everything we have, they have, right? With the exception of we have a great satellite system and they have a super flawed one. Theirs is called Tundra. And even um, Pavel Podvig admitted that there are serious flaws in Tundra. Uh, the Russian satellite system, for example, can mistake sunlight for flames, can mistake clouds for a nuclear launch. This is a fact, okay? <laughs> and, um, you know, what was interesting in interviewing him was also this recent, very, very dangerous shift in nuclear, Russian nuclear policy, which is this. Many Russian experts will tell you that Russia has always maintained that it never had a launch on warning policy. Now, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I'm just telling you what they say. And this is coming from the generals, the Cold War generals in Soviet Russia saying, oh, no, 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 we would wait. They were kind of playing the noble warrior. We would wait to absorb a nuclear attack until we launched, okay? So many Americans, you know, experts will tell you that that's just posturing and propaganda. Mm -hmm. But that was their official position. And that changed just two years ago when Putin gave a speech and he said, that their position had changed, that they will no longer wait to absorb an attack, that they, once they learn of, how did he phrase it? He called it like the the, the trajectory of the missiles, right? Which is a way of, of sort of talking about parody, the same way we see the missile coming over in mid-course. Putin made that same statement and said we would launch. What do you know of the way Putin thinks about nuclear weapons and nuclear war? Is it just something to allude to in a speech, or do you think he contemplates the possibilities of nuclear war? I don't know, but if I had to guess, it would go like this. I would look at his background, and he comes from the intelligence world, right? So my experience in interviewing old-timers who have spent decades working for the CIA, or even NRO, or NSA, I know the way they think from having spent hundreds of hours interviewing them, right? And then I know the way that you know, military men think, and it's very different, right? So Putin's not a military person per se. He's an intelligence officer. So what con would concern me there, if I had to guess about his mindset, has to do with paranoia, right? Most intelligence officers must have a degree of healthy paranoia or they're going to wind up dead, right? Right? And so that's not a great quality to have. You would be more trigger happy, perhaps. Uh, so you're more, you would be more prone to respond to erroneous signals. And and you'd be suspicious. And you can see that now. There's a, such a, you know, incredible distrust and, and, and sort of real conflict between Russia, between its leader, and NATO, between its leader and all of the West. And then that is fueled by his closest advisors. Um, kind of, you know, seem they seem to be, from the statements they have made that I've read in translation, they seem to be fostering that same idea that, you know, NATO really has it in for Russia. The, America really has it in. And that is so dangerous and disheartening. And perhaps makes it less likely that the president would pick up the phone and talk to the other president. And or that the close advisors near the president would make that happen. 